<laughs> okay, can I have everyone's attention please? Uh, Dunham Basu is about to start his talk about Brexit and IT and how it affects everybody in this room. And, um, well, I don't want to say too much, but this is going to be an interactive session, so if you have any questions throughout any of this presentation, please don't hesitate to raise your questions and interrupt. And uh, enjoy the session. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks good on here. How do I get it on there? Okay. Well, once again, it's doing that. Let me, uh, let me give you a, a funny thing happened on my way to the forum. Story. When I was coming here, I was in a, in a cab because I'm actually staying at a hotel <coughs> quite close to the station <coughs> because I foolishly thought that you guys would have a meeting in Nottingham, you see, as opposed to somewhere, <laughs> somewhere way out in the wastelands <laughs> between Nottingham and somewhere else. I don't even know where I am. So I got a cab to come here and coming along, we were talking about how dangerous it is to drive in London. And the cabbie was saying, oh, you know, I really don't like it. I find it really scary to just be a pedestrian in London, let alone to drive, you know, and look at all those moped things that are happening as well, moped gangs and so on. It's really, it sounds really dangerous. Just then, bang, another car had <laughs> hit our boot. <laughs> The other car I thought was completely in the wrong uh, because turned suddenly you know, from one lane to another and bang, hit our boots. So, you know, um, that's my story of getting, coming here. And you know, I just want to ask you, is it really that dangerous driving in Nottingham? <laughs> do, you, do you have no moped gangs as well or is it just, <laughs> is it just taxi gangs who randomly swerve across lanes and crash into things? I mean, you know, I, I notice you've all got the requisite number of limbs, but I, I suppose that's just a matter of chance and uh, good luck and so on, is it? <laughs> okay, chance and good luck. So there are two things that we could do with on there, and lots of it as well, I think. Especially, some people say, with what's going to come up in the next year or two. And um, uh, I should stress that I live in... North London. I live in London, I live in North London, and London, of course, were, uh, was an absolute remain uh, area, as it were. Not surprisingly, because in London, um, I think there are people from around 150 countries. Now, my background includes PwC, and I was uh, part of Y2K and watching, you know, the clock swing through midnight and all that sort of stuff and think something must go wrong, something must go wrong. We've put in all these years of effort, you know. Uh, we've been accused of overspending grossly in terms of IT. Something must go wrong. And I was watching, watching, watching. And I know there are at least 155 countries because I was responsible for the contact list of the key people in each of PwC's countries. So, you know, I, that, that's the time when I learned how many countries there were. And then subsequently I learned that there are representatives of most of those countries in London. So, wow, what a wonderful melting pot of a city, but what a wonderful melting pot of a country as well. Result of 10 invasions, I believe. You know, so that's why we talk about going to the attic and also to the loft. And... and uh, <clears throat> down to the cellar or the basement because the words we use derive from some of the legacy gained from the, um, let's see, the uh, um, Saxons. Oh, Saxon, that's in Germany. And the Normans. The Normans, i.e. French legacy and so on. So there's a lot of internationalism in the UK. That probably gives you a little bit of an inkling of which way I'm inclined, but uh, I'll tell you more about that as we go. Now, I'm going to ask you something. Um, what I'm going to present 
it displays my lack of spelling skills, of course, because I thought that's how you spell Brexit. <laughs> it's how I spell Brexit. But, of course, what I'm going to present to you is actually an IT readiness plan. And so, who is an IT person here? All? Or oh, not all? Are you, sir? And I'm retired. That's okay. I'm retired too. <laughs> but uh, were you an IT person? Games programmer. Right. Okay, great. I'll take it that we're all IT people and I'll speak on, on that basis. In IT, I think we're very lucky, but more of that later as well. Now, what I'd like to ask you is this. What does Brexit mean to you? Brexit spelled, you know, the, the regular way. What does Brexit mean to you? So, anybody like to say, what does Brexit mean to you? Um, departing from the European Union. Okay. Yeah. And, by the way, we've got a super size of audience. We're, you know, you're, you're part of a select group. You're, Gary's, uh, uh, Gary's tribe here, you know, you're part of a select group and I think we've got a fantastic role that we can play in terms of BCS. And that will c come out as well during the talk. Okay, so departing from the EU, so what does Brexit mean to you? Brexit to me, um, from a technical point of view, uh, my main concerns are in terms of where information is going to be, as we come out of Brexit. Um, because I now work in the public sector rather than commercial, probably the immediate broader impacts are less now. Um, but that's that's where my main concerns are. I don't have okay. particular concerns from a skills point of view. Okay. So. Okay, that's great. Just give me some highlights, some, you know, uh, two or three words in terms of what does Brexit mean to you? Madam, what does Brexit mean to you? Um, gaining control of our laws. Mm, gaining control of? The laws in this country. The laws, okay. Uh, um, what does Brexit mean to you? Essentially an expensive mistake. Expensive mistake. What does Brexit mean to you? Uh, it's a very silly <coughs> idea. In my view, um, in 1945, we should have imposed the British pound on France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, okay, so uh, his, his, histor historical for note there. Um, Madam, what does Brexit mean to you? Change. Change. Okay. What does Brexit mean to you? Uh, uh, I was going to say sort of project fear versus project lies. Mm. Lies one. Okay, fear and lies. Gosh, <laughs> what does Brexit mean to you? Yeah. Yeah. Lack of opportunity. Yeah. Massive. Ah, that's interesting. Massive opportunity in the IT sector. Mm. What does that mean to you? Um, potentially a much tougher trading market. Tougher trading market? Uh, for me, I think it's a shambles because I don't think people appreciate the complexity mm -hmm. of what's going to happen. Okay. Little under, um, insufficiently understood could be a shambles. Um, other people, what does Brexit mean to you, sir? Um, it's about controlling the border on the, within the European Co Control the borders, yeah. So, nationalism and isolation. Nationalism and isolation. Okay, so what does Brexit mean to you? Lack of red tape. Lack of red tape, good. Like your red T-shirt, by the way. <laughs> what does Brexit mean? Change of regulations. Change of regulations. Possible um, labour issues. Mm, great. What does Brexit mean to you? Um, uncertainty. Uncertainty, okay. The unknown. The unknown, okay. You can have another say if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just coming, but most of my views are... That's great. Right. That. Um, David, what does Brexit mean to Brexit you? Brexit means Brexit. <laughs> wow, thank goodness for that. Hey, you and me both, brother. <laughs> okay. And Gary, what does Brexit mean to you? A lot of deregulation and a lot of re-regulation. Okay. De-re-regulation. Good. Okay. Super. Well, those are... Thank you for those views.
Those views are all fun. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really sorry. But we, 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 we've been brexed out. So, so, so that's it. So thank you very much. And um, Gary, where do I get my check? <laughs> uh, okay. Those are all very valid views. And this is the thing that I find as I go around talking about Brexit, because I seem to have become our Brexit king in, in BCS. Really bizarre, because all it is, is that I went to a BCS meeting, one of the BCS thought leadership meetings, you know, because we're all in BCS only. Anybody not in BCS yet? Yeah? <gasps> okay, Shh. keep quiet about this to anybody who's not BCS, yeah? Otherwise, I may, might have to get everybody else to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I went to something that was run by BCS, and it was very plush, it was really super actually, it was near the BBC offices in Salford Keys in Manchester. Plush hotel, uh, soft light, sweet music, uh, drinks flowing, and some inspirational speakers, where well, I later discovered uh, the people who are on the circuit and cost lots of money to, uh, to talk. And it was really inspirational, it was great, it was sort of... Is there life after Brexit? You bet there is. There's going to be lots of opportunities and wonderful things happening for the UK after Brexit. And I thought, wow, this is really inspirational. Wait a minute. Where's the substance? What is it we're supposed to do to get from now till later? And I thought, hmm, didn't quite catch that. So I spoke to BCS high ups so and I said, um, that was great, but... BCS could really help by spelling out some steps that we, especially all the IT people in SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, could follow. I said, absolutely right. I said, okay, good. So will there be something like that coming? And they said, well, there will if you do it. So I thought, right, I'll do it. So I've done it. So has the BCS taken it on? and, uh, you know, put his flag there. Um, I think the BCS is sort of thinking about it. Um, so, for about the last six or seven months, um, possibly more, <coughs> BCS member groups have been referring people to me to say, oh, here's another group that would like to hear you speak about Brexit. So I'm doing this with their full knowledge. So I've spoken at Elite, at my North London branch, of course, in London, but also other BCS groups, up to BCS Edinburgh, down to BCS Jersey. Last week it was Manchester in the first part of the week, and in the second part of the week it was BCS Sussex. So, you know, I am asking people and involving people all the time, and I've come to see that part of my role in this is to get you engaged in BCS meetings. But there is also something, some substance that I would like to engage with you on in terms of this Brexit methodology that I'll propose. But let's go, go through our general uh, chat first about Brexit, because that's something else. Everybody has an opinion about Brexit. Everybody knows about it and has an opinion, like, like you all do, and they're different opinions, but we don't express them, usually. <laughs> In public, so this is your opportunity to do that. Now, I need guidance. I really do. I mean, you know, this this thing that I mentioned to you. Uh, no, that I point to that, don't I? And I point upwards or downwards or that way. Good. I need guidance, and fortunately, I have a hero. The lady on the left, and. That is great. You recognize the call to arms, don't you? Your country needs you, and so on. And there she is, telling us exactly what Brexit means. It means Brexit. And I'm afraid, I haven't updated this, that should, of course, be many times in 2016 and 17. And she's still doing it. But she's been caught out in a sense because she's been asked to elaborate a little bit more. So I've developed another hero, Mr. Carney. Why Mr. Carney? He's not even British. What right does he have to make predictions about things? Well, look at what he said. Hmm, preferable that you know where you're going and how you're going to get there. 
Um, do you know, I rather like that. That has a certain ring of truth about it, doesn't it? And to us IT people, I mean, it sounds like, you know, a set of steps. You do A, B, C, D, and you get to D. Yippee. Does that sound right? So I like that. Now, by the way, I have put URLs on the bottom of um, quite a lot of slides. So when you get these, if Gary's going to give them to you, uh, feel free to click and you'll see more up-to-date information. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's a keynote here. What does Brexit mean? Well, my latest information, as at this morning, is we don't know. But, you know, keep that to yourselves. <laughs> and especially you, you're not even a BCS person. <laughs> Highly recommend. Hook up with Gary later. Before anybody else tries to kill you, join the BCS. Yes, you <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just join the BCS, then they won't need to try. <laughs> now, I've gone backwards, which is, of course, typical of me. So let's go forwards again. Right, okay. What we do know is that we have other things happening at the moment as well. And, ah, uh, oh, stop it. You know, there are lots of buttons in this game. <laughs> right. We have lots of things happening in the IT world, of course. GDPR, what's that? Who, who knows what GDPR is? General data protection regulation. Right. Uh, UK general data? No, European, encompassing at the EU. EU. Mm. <coughs> That's interesting. So, does that apply it to us? It still applies to us until we're out. Uh, <coughs> Interesting. Okay. And then they'll then they'll put it all into our law anyway. Great. So until it's repealed. Really, <laughs> really simple then. Two letters EU. Substitute one of them, move the other one round, and you get UK. So it's likely to become UK GDPR unless all the provisos you make. That's good. What we do know is somebody says that. Now who is the somebody? Well, in our world, it's the highly respected Computer Weekly. And they said that two-thirds of firms are, uh, are recruiting. Now, what they actually meant is possibly something we, we could debate. This was uh, in August 2017, so the day before yesterday. Um, most UK firms are planning to hire extra staff to help them to meet the requirements of the EU's new data protection regulation. Now, Gary, have you had a talk on GDPR, or would you plan to? Yes, we have. Good, super. So you're all experts in GDPR. So when I say to you, are you, you know, are, are you all on uh, paracetamols or on DPO? You will immediately spot that's a trick question because DPO stands for data protection officer. Ah, data protection officer. Great. So how many DPOs do you know? Six. Six. One. Yeah, you, you know one, you know one. Yeah. Are you one? No. No, okay, so that's, this is pretty typical. And I'll start giving you comparative stats from the other sessions I've had. It, let's say there are, what, are there 15, 18 of us here, Gary? Uh, I think we're still there. Okay. 20. 20. Okay, great. Of the 20 of us, I mean, this fits nicely. 2%, uh, sorry, 2, i.e. 10%, have heard of, uh, have, sorry, no a deep DPO. Now that's pretty good going, isn't it really? Considering that GDPR actually has a date attached to it. Do you know the date for GDPR coming into force? March, 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 March. Almost. It's actually the 25th of May, 2018. Which is great, isn't it? That gives us a few months to get things together. Wait a minute. It gives us a few months to get things together. We are now in... It's, uh, it's 2016 now, isn't it? Oh, no. Oh, God. And we're running towards the end of October 2017. But never mind. We're IT people. This is about data. Data is our bread and butter. Information, that's us, yeah? Information is IT. So what's the problem? I mean, should we worry about a GDPR deadline of um, uh, the 25th of uh, yeah. May um, 2018? Yeah. yeah, why? Why? It's about data. We've got data. We back it up regularly. We back it up daily, some of us, and send it off to, well, we'll get to where we send it off to later. <laughs> um, and uh, we know all about it. And 
We're not, is anyone in the NHS? No? And we're not in the NHS, right? All to do with personal data, virtually. So, um, we're okay, aren't we? Yeah? Is that okay? Why not? What's, what's the big issue? Control of data. Control of data, that's right. Well, also, I mean, just to you know, bring this around to the uh, conversation pieces of that. Um, I think the best GDPR information that I've read was, is from a top law firm and is 91 pages. You can get it on PDF. Uh, 91 pages and basically comprises 13 things you need to do for GDPR. 13 things, 91 pages, use your imagination, <laughs> there is a lot to do. Um, and the other worry is um, that I've had sessions with um, people for, uh, with um, uh, people in, in London, for North London branch, of course, including people from recruitment agencies. So I've dropped in uh, you know, questions like, what does 4% mean to you? And none of them said, that's the commission rate that I expect, because <laughs> guess what? <laughs> Which would have been an understandable answer. Um, almost all of them said 4%. Not sure, you know. In fact, in the early days, you know, ooh, must be about six months ago, all of them said that. Now, 4% is something that people are beginning to realize uh, has a meaning. What does 4% mean to, I'm going to pick on you now for not being a BCS <coughs> member, even though you will be able to with going. number of people are compliant? Do <laughs> Ah, yeah, public sector, we know how compliant we are, yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. So you think it's to do with the number of people who... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Any other guesses? 4%? Five, you can get on the total revenue from the RCO. Really? So worldwide. Afraid so. So, I'm retired, I have a fantastic job. I earn £100 a year. Not from you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I earn £100 a year, so I'm likely to be here. If I don't... Come, you know, if I don't meet GDPR rules by the 25th of May 2018, I'm likely to have to pay up to a maximum of four, of four pounds. I can take it. You know, I'll grin and bear that. That's not an issue. I forgot. I used to be in a global firm with global turnover of many hundreds of millions of pounds. Ah. That's kind of a little bit more interesting and relevant, isn't it? And with data, information, going across borders all the time, across jurisdictions, which is, of course, partly the reason why GDPR came about, because the, we need to standardize information flowing between places and so on. So now, 4% becomes much more of a serious threat. But what is much worse than 4% if you fail GDPR? Um, in risk management terms, the worst thing that can happen to you is your reputational damage. Yeah? So, um, you know, the 4% is relatively trivial in terms of what happens to your, to your firm. Who has heard of Gerald Ratner? No? No? Ah, okay. Some of us have heard of Gerald Ratner, who famous, famously was a guest on a TV show, and he was the head of uh, Britain's largest jewellery firm, or one of the largest jewellery firms in the UK. And he was asked, and I, I, I didn't see it, but I'm making this up slightly. He was asked, well, would you buy your jewellery? And he famously said something along the lines of, no, it's a load of tat. <laughs> right. He folded... Ratner's the jewellers folded, it's all part of history. Who's heard of Arthur Anderson? Nice man, Arthur Anderson. Why have you heard of Arthur Anderson? The consultancy a few years ago. Mm. Yeah, it was a consultancy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, the same. Arthur Anderson was around as a major um, audit, compliance, accountancy firm at a time when it was known as one of the big five. We haven't heard that expression for a long time. 
because Arthur Anderson were the auditors to another firm that uh, is part of our history called Enron. And something happened to Enron. Arthur Anderson were their auditors. Enron went down. Um, they're still around. You know, can go and visit chief executive in jail in the US. <laughs> still, I believe. Uh, and then Arthur Anderson went down. Fabulously unfair, I'd say, as an ex-PwC person. <laughs> Absolutely not their fault. Reputational damage. Really, really bad. Okay. GDPR, that's the real threat in terms of not having our data well. That's the reason why two-thirds, at least, of the FTSE 100, maybe the FTSE 250, are definitely on the case about GDPR. They've got teams of people. And they need more people. Because, of course, to check out all our data and what's happening to it and so on, across the firm is, you know, a big job. Okay. Um, but mean old Financial Times here, also in August, said businesses are failing to prepare for British regulations, for Brexit and other, other things like that. So, hold on, two-thirds of UK firms are hiring for GDPR, so that must mean there's a whole load of extra opportunities for us, yeah? So, wonderful opportunities, especially if you're an IT person. Providing you at least read up Wikipedia or something, maybe, what a, D, what a DPO is, and get yourself DPO'd as quickly as possible. By which I mean absolutely red hot urgently as quickly as possible, because you've only got a few months to get your firm together. And so loads and loads and loads of people should be looking for DPOs right now. As long as they don't go to recruitment agencies who don't know what DPOs are. So here's opportunity one for you. Tip one. Check out what a DPO is and does. Check out something about GDPR. Go see a recruitment consultancy and say, listen, in order for you, eh, sorry, in order for you to find lots of extra revenue for yourself and a job for me, I'm going to tell you a little bit about GDPR and about DPOs and give you a tip that you need to start recruiting them. So we need that. So lots more people. Wonderful. So that's good. Oh, this isn't good. Oh, here we are. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Forgot. This is supposed to be about Brexit, not GDPR. So GDPR, I've got that in my mind now. 25th of May, 2018. I know that for a fact because I ran two events in London on the 24th and 25th of May this year with four speakers in each. And they were good. The, the joint was jumping, the rooms are full, there were about 120 people in one, 100 people in the other. Great stuff. So we're all well versed in GDPR. But what's this here? If we call GDPR today's big thing in the compliance and regulation world, Brexit may well become tomorrow's big thing. And here we have something which is based on current news. I mean, you know, is it true, is it not? Is it fake news? Who knows? Uh, I must consult a man I know in America. I'll send him a tweet to ask him if Brexit is going to happen or not. Um, freedom of movement to end in March 2019. Well, who believes that? I mean, who thinks it's actually going to come into force in March 2019? Yeah? Okay, fine. Here's an old-fashioned way to work. You talk about something, then you sit down with pieces of paper and you sign them, and it becomes a law. And then it happens. You know, Magna Carta, etc., etc., etc. And the date on the bit of paper is the end of March 2019. So that's how it stands. So if that's not going to happen, there've got to be some jolly good reasons why not. Yeah, um, and Brexit is supposed to happen at the end of March 2019. All right. So lots of people being sucked sucked up for GDPR. Oh, wait a minute. And since the Brexit vote, big net migration fall. Who says that? 
Uh, I'm starting not to believe any of this. I'm beginning to think all of this is fake news. Computer Weekly, FT, BBC, they ought to know better. But they say that. When did they say it? Oh no, in August 2017. And they've kept on saying this because there are now signs about people leaving the UK. Now why should they do that? You know, I mean, this is a fantastic place to live. Um, and I must say, North London, that's the place. Yeah? <laughs> you might well say Nottingham, but you know, everyone has their own views. So why should they want to leave? Well, there is a big demand for people in IT, but there is also going to be a demand for people to do with Brexit later. We will see this uh, later. Meanwhile, the numbers of people are falling. So how do we match all that up? There's going to be this new role called DPO and others to do with GDPR. So we need more people, but the number of people are falling. Now, why should they fall when we live in such an attractive part of the world? You know, not everybody gets to use their umbrellas almost every day, after all, in most places. So why should they want to leave? Ah, there's something else as well, and this is to do with Brexit. Related to Brexit, have you noticed when you go abroad that you can't do quite as much with your pound as you used to? Yeah? Because I have, and it hurts. <laughs> and so, when you go abroad, you find your pound isn't worth so much. Alternatively, when you are here, let's say you're Polish, and you're earning pounds and sending it, some of it back to Poland, and it's not worth so much, it makes it a little bit less attractive to work here. So, there are various factors which have started working already. And of course, um, we must protect our borders, which is absolutely right. So that should also result in fewer of these horrible EU people coming to the UK. So um, hmm, that might actually reduce parts of the workforce as well, I suppose. Um, oh, let's switch back to our world. Computer Weekly, what did they say? More news like this. Brexit could spell disaster for UK IT. Who writes these articles? Who is on the uh, uh, editorial of Computer Weekly? Are they spreading for fake news? Has Russia got anything to do with this? That's what I'm really secretly wondering. Financial Times, again in August, Euro hits eight-year high against the pound. Strong Eurozone data and Brexit uncertainty drive sterling sharply lower. It's not that sharp, is it? But it does make a difference, and I'm noticing. I'm not used to the pound and Euro having the same value, but that's virtually how it is. It's uh, 1.09 Euros per pound. So we're still winning, just about. Okay, good. What should we do about it? Well, shouldn't the government do something about it by getting everybody together and saying, hey chaps, here's what to do about Brexit. I told you that I've been going up and down the country for BCS doing these talks. And so I picked on Jersey um, as being one example, uh, and they, the government of Jersey, has actually run at least one Brexit workshop for their states of Jersey members. Yeah? And they've also sent out a survey to all Jersey-based companies, which in essence says, what do you think about, what do you expect from Brexit for your company? Yeah. What do you think the implications might be in business terms? Do you need, uh, you know, um, what will you need, and how can we help? And they've started collating all of that together. I think that's a good idea, don't you? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I know a government of ours that could well benefit from this sort of advice. Now, just a couple of points about Jersey. I found it really, really interesting being in Jersey. Because, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, the people of Jersey are st have started to feel really cut off. Can you imagine why? Because they're near France? They are near France. They're only 40... It's a, 
an island or rather a set of islands parked 14 miles off France. So you can actually see France, it's over there, that little line on the horizon is actually France, yeah? And they get all their stuff from the UK. So they get um, French cheese and French cars and lots of other things through Southampton. And they are ardently British. They are really, really, really true blue British. Probably at least half as ardently British as the people of Gibraltar, maybe a quarter as ardently British as the people of the Falkland Islands, and so on. We're just thinking, wait a minute, Brexit, UK government, dithering, what do we do? Where are we going to be? So what's happened in Jersey, just picking on that example again, is that they really, really need international business because Jersey is a, um, what would you call it, a financial capital, isn't it? Jersey, hmm? sorry. And tax haven. And tax haven. Jersey really, really has a strong financial underpinning. And that's not just from the UK. Yeah? So they are really worried about their relationship to the euro and all the, all the rest of those things. And what they are worried about as well is this isn't just Jersey. The people of Guernsey are watching the people of Jersey to see what, what's going to happen. And then you probably know that it's a group of islands. So there's Alderney, Sark, and uh, somewhere else. Jethu or something? Yeah. Herm. Herm, yeah. So those islands are all roughly in the same position as, as it were. And they're thinking, oh my God, what's going to happen next? Because they get all their stuff from the UK. I was astonished by that, but that, that, that's how it is. So we were looking for a French supermarket because of the camembert, cheese, wine, French wine, great. You know? French supermarket, no chance. There are no French shops on Jersey. And, uh, you know, uh, I was told that as an absolute. <laughs> I was, what? You're joking. Look, France is over there. Yes, we get all those things from the UK. Yeah, that's how much they are British. Yeah, so Jersey, the people of Jersey are worried. Did I mention the Isle of Man? No? Okay. Did I mention Northern Ireland? With that enormous, porous border where there used to be very good <laughs> policing in the past, men with submachine guns wearing balaclavas, meeting out their own kind of justice. They really, really, really do not want to go back to there when Northern Ireland stays with the UK and ERA remains with the EU. They are really, really worried about that. That's why that's one of the big talking points from the EU side in the Brexit negotiations. Yeah? So, um, what does that all this mean? Let's bring this to Brexit, and then we'll get down to our IT side of things. Um, again, I'm reassured because... Oh, no, I didn't mean to be that reassured. Hold on, let's go back and back and back. Yeah, I'm reassured because I looked at gov.uk, and again, you'll find all these links here, and you'll find the latest information. And I was reassured by seeing... What you need to know, here we are, there is no need for EU citizens living in the UK to do anything now. There will be no change to the status of EU citizens living in the UK while the UK remains in the EU. If you'd like to find out the latest information, you can sign up for email updates, which is great to know, isn't it, really? So, that's it. So, what's all the fuss about? Why worry? You don't need to worry whilst we're in the EU. Oh, wait a minute. What's that date I mentioned to you earlier? Did I say some did I mention something about March 2019? Mm hmm. Right. So until March 2019, don't worry. Just relax, carry on, keep taking the tablets, etc. Keep taking the DPO, <laughs> etc. Right, well that's all good to know. Now I am very I have to confess, I am very, very involved with this. I I 
live with Brexit 24-7. Yeah? Now, David might know this, but most of you won't know that my wife is German. And she is very incensed about all this. She, my, my wife is German. She's lived in the UK for 30 years. I, I can vouch for that. She's the, head of a, uh, she's the head of a school, and she's taught tens of thousands of children in Gulich, Mate, 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 uh, Saya, uh, and all those other things you learn. Yeah, primary school. Good. And she said to me the day after the uh, Brexit vote, she said, I can't believe it. I really cannot believe it. If they don't want me, I don't want them. Let's go off and find somewhere else to live. Let's, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> Be Russian one. What, what are you talking about? She said, no. Nobody has written to me to tell me I am wanted here. In the absence of somebody telling me I'm wanted, well, I assume I'm not wanted. You can imagine that cost me quite a few dinners and, you know, uh, tender loving care and you are wanted and all that sort of stuff. But it's true. She still hasn't had any notification from any official body that she is allowed to stay in the UK. Now, um, that isn't just for her, of course. It's for three million people in the UK. I think there are more than three million EU citizens here. I know there are at least one million Polish people here. And incidentally, I've been asked to go and speak about Brexit in Warsaw. So, you know, just to give you a, an idea of we are not alone, we're not alone, they're really worried as well. <laughs> you see. So, uh, the numbers are supposed to be three million or more EU citizens in the UK. So this is all good news, isn't it? Because more jobs required, fewer people. So if you're here, if you're in IT, if you want to earn more money and all that sort of stuff, lots of good opportunities coming up. Looking at it from the other point of view, let's take a scenario where, um, well, uh, do, you, do you belong to a health club? Yeah. No? No health no. clubs? No, no, none of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's say you belong to a health club, and you, just, uh, you say, look, like your health club, like the facilities, like to keep using them, just want to stop paying, and stop being a member. Is that okay? And they say, well, sure. Part of that's okay. <laughs> Stopping being a member is okay. No problem. Yeah? Uh, stopping paying the fees is okay. Using the facilities afterwards is not okay. Yeah? So there's a little analogy that uh, I've heard a number of times. Um, and that is how the EU negotiators seem to be thinking about things. In terms of the UK, of course, we say, well, you know, that's what we want to do. And there's one of us, and there's 27 of you. So all it needs is for you to decide to agree with us. And so that would be okay. And that seems to be some semblance of the deadlock we have. The other things, again, from my personal point of view, is that the EU focus is on what happens to people, which is pretty naive, isn't it? I mean, it's a business world. Who cares what happens to people? Yeah? What happens to people? What happens to EU nationals in the UK, of which we believe there are more than 3 million? What happens to UK people in the EU. That is the number one agenda item, I believe, in terms of, of the EU negotiating stance. The second is, oh, and by the way, what about all those, uh, what, what about all the money you owe us? Because, you know, um, uh, your unpaid subscriptions to the health club and, you know, all, all that sort of thing, and uh, the fact that you've got to keep on paying for another year. Um, Let's sort those things out, and then we can talk about what we do in the future. But from what I understand, the impression I get is um, the UK stance is, right, we're going to leave you, and we want to continue to have quite a lot of the benefits we've shared for the last 40 years. After all, we're founder members virtually and so on. 
And the first thing we want to do is to decide about the, bus uh, about the business terms and conditions going forward. So I think that might be some semblance of what's happening here. What I do know is that my wife is really miffed and that we did, we go to Germany quite frequently. So we went to Germany and we had a chat with somebody, an estate agent in Frankfurt. And uh, he said, and I said, how are you doing? And so on. He said, oh, great, but I'm going to be absolutely fantastic soon. And I said, why is that? He said, um, I'll show you some things about the price of apartments in central Frankfurt, the business districts and the you know, areas just around there. I said, look, these ones have gone up by 25% in the rental has gone up by 25% in the last six months. Um, I said, there's only one logical explanation for that. We don't have a huge influx of people. We're getting a trickle of people coming in, but they see a huge expectation. Yeah? So, that's Frankfurt. Um, Santander has announced an increase in its investment in Amsterdam. RBS it has set up new facilities in Amsterdam. Um, the La Défense business district of Paris isn't sitting there waiting. They've sent people shopping to London and they didn't go into Harrods once, from what I hear, yeah? Because they are shopping to say, you come to us, we give you a fresh croissant and a camembert and a big increase in your salary. Come and join us. And they've sent a number of those groups, teams of people to London already. Um, I haven't mentioned Milan, Geneva, Zurich, Brussels, and the other places. But there is a lot of interesting things. Some organizations are moving um, some of their facilities to Ireland, to Dublin as well. I think there's probably a common cause behind some of this, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's been really interesting because I, you know, I'm, I'm saying quite provocative things and giving you my personal opinions about things, of course. But, uh, uh, and you're taking this quite passively, or maybe you just think I'm a fool or whatever, but <laughs> I'm doing this provocatively because I want you to engage in conversation and so on, and because I've been in BCS for more than 35 years, apparently, um, and I'm only 36, um, so, <laughs> and I want you to be voices within BCS. And I want BCS to be a voice that does influence others, yeah? That's why. We can make a difference, and a little bit more about that during the next few minutes. Okay, so there's all of that, and um, I'm going to give you a radical, different idea in a moment. Um, the radical, different idea is this. What do you think is the main asset in your company? People. people. Oh. You, you people are really boring. You all have the same idea. Isn't it IT infrastructure? <coughs> networks? Customers. Robots? Customers? Customers, yes. Business. Isn't business the main factor? If your people are depleted, and in London, this is a very serious issue. It's a real consideration. Lots of EU people, as well as other nationalities, are in London, of course. You want to do business. One of the plans you should make is, how are you going to do business with 100 people minus 6, 7, 10, 15? Those are some of the strategies you've got to get together. Yeah? Because that's the picture that I've painted, and I don't think it's just speculation. It's something that we really have to take care of. Um, but look, we're in IT. Um, there are lots of, lots of industries, lots of 
sectors in the marketplace. Here are some of them. And I just put that, I mean, we're in technology, let's say. But there are lots of others, aren't there? I mean, how about, for example, how about farming? How, how about agriculture, yeah? Well, there's a Guardian quote. Again, you, you can see I was doing a lot of searching on the internet around the 5th of August. The Guardian. Britain could leave Brexit with a bare larder, farmers warn. The National Farmers Union says, UK, says the UK produces only 60% of its own food and must increase production to avoid food insecurity after leaving the EU. Oh, no. They told us not to produce it. Hmm? That's right, they told us not to produce it. And why did they tell us not to produce it? Exactly. They can't, they can't keep up. That's I mean, my, my sister lives out in Lincolnshire, and that's not, what, that's not what they're saying. And that thing about the 60% is called the as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've... I think personally, a lot of this stuff, having lived through the, the miners' strike, I know you've got mining up there and we don't have one of those anymore, but having lived through the miners' strike and seeing how that was misrepresented, the, nowadays media's manipulated. You can't trust anything you see. So it could be fake news. Right, interesting. Okay. Not so much fake, more Bias. manipulated to, to yeah. give a particular type of... I've seen Bias. no end of it this week on... Yeah. Doom, gloom, doom, gloom, doom, gloom. You never see anybody on the television standing up and saying something positive mm. about things. Yes, there are opportunities. Yes, there are going to be issues. I mean, I've got no doubt that there's not going to be issues, because there are. And this government seems to be sitting on their hands on it. Mm. Um, but then I don't trust them as far as I can throw. Mm. You've got a stayer leading a, a, a leaving nation. I mean, all right, not everybody voted for it, but a, a huge percentage of us did. We were and how many times do you hear a Brexiters get a voice? A normal person, not yeah. politicians. Mm. When, you, when you talk to other people and say, how are you feeling about this? Yes, there are some. Because we've been left hanging mm. the con as a country. Mm. That's how I feel about it, isn't it. Great. Well, this is good. And other opinions, please. Yeah. The thing is, they can't tell us anything because nothing's certain yet. Because they, haven't mm -hmm. they don't they haven't, do they? They haven't negotiated it. Okay. No, this is absolutely valid. And let me just tell you that uh, in other meetings that I've had, there are lots more pro-Brexit views and votes. And of course, I'm trying to provoke you into giving opinions and so on, and uh, you know, so that we can have uh, an informed debate uh, about this. But I, I hope you'll continue to discuss these things afterwards, of course. Yeah? I was, I was going to say, I think... The mindset in London is vastly different to the majority of the rest of England, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, it's London in the South East, to be Yeah, fair. London in the uh, South East. And Scotland. I said yeah. England. <laughs> you, just, you just said it there, you said Scotland. Yeah. 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 Uh, you go, and Scotland, but a huge percentage of them voted to leave as well. Yeah. But they, they say, oh no, no, no we that, voted that's to, what we I was trying to, to say. Stay, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. No. Good. Well, th no, this is, this is great. The... The thing I was going to say about <coughs> uh, agriculture <coughs> is this. Picking potato uh, yeah, picking potatoes, do, doing all doing all of those manual, intensely manual things, maybe employing students, summer labor and so on. There is an area where uh, if I was a farmer in that particular sector, I would worry. Where are my cheap laborers going to come from. That's something that I worry about. I'm not quite sure what I'd do about it. But my theme for this evening is, look, there are lots of different sectors where um, reduced manpower would be a concern, as well as the, uh, the other issues. Healthcare is another such, which I think we won't discuss too much now. We can, just imagine, do you feel your heart thumping when you think about healthcare issues post-Brexit? I do. We, however, are in IT. This was PwC um, information as well, by the way, but uh, there's lots more click-click links. On the theme of PwC, ah, on the theme of PwC, they did this, Supply Chain, Your Brexit Competitive Advantage Report from PwC Global. 
which includes things like uh, VAT questions for you to think about, supply chain hubs, lead times, grants and incentives, tariffs, legal, and of course customs. Because if we go to an actual Brexit stage and we leave, what about those? The supply chain worries me considerably because if you buy things, are you buying only from your local area? Could be you are, which is great. Where are they buying from would be the question I'd ask you. We need to think about these things, is the point I'm trying to make. And we're in IT, and I will try and tell you that we're actually in a great position because the unknowns and the uncertainties are somewhat less unknown and uncertain than we might think from the general discussion. We'll get to that in a moment. But supply chain, your company buys things. Where from? And are they immune from what's going to help the uncertainties of Brexit? More to the point, are they planning for it? Have they done something which is, if this, then that? Yeah? Your sales chain, who do you sell to? And how will you continue to sell to them? Will a French company decide not to do business with you because of the hassle of the tariffs, the, um, the customs, paperwork and stuff that ha ha has to happen and so on, and go instead to a French or German or any one of 27 other countries instead of the UK. That's the danger. Um, we had a little inkling of this from a different angle in terms of Bombard and Bombardier and so on, uh, um, about what can happen when some, some country gets cut out of a particular chain. But the amusing thing, I don't know if you saw it, but in London, the Standard got a special wrapper um, about four or five days ago, I think it was. And that wrapper, I thought, huh? What is this? It was a, a wrapper meaning four pages, yeah? And the outside of it, advertising, Boeing, and all the fantastic things it does, including all the fantastic things it does in the UK. Completely by chance, I'm sure, you know, total coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've never ever seen a, a, a wraparound advert for a major uh, an aircraft company before um, on an on evening <coughs> newspaper. Supply chain, lots of different things that we need to think about. And now we get to the basic point, and we need to start thinking about those things now. Because if we start thinking, you know, who is a Boy Scout? Women excluded, please. Who is a Boy Scout? Here? Were you a Boy Scout? Fantastic. So you'll know all about being prepared. And that's what we need to do. So, my premise is, for IT, Brexit means risk, but also opportunities, many opportunities. And for example, if your company can demonstrably show it's getting ready for Brexit and thinking about it, and you can advertise that, then there will be competitive advantage. If five companies are in this particular um, uh, area where I want to buy some goods from, and one of them shows that it's forward thinking and can guarantee what it's going to do for me for the next five years, and the others can't, I'm more likely to think favorably of them, aren't I? Okay. Fine. In IT, there have been lots of compliance programs. Um, who is involved with uh, Y2K? Yeah? Right. Now look, this is something, I, an aside that I must ask you. Are you aware of any problems that happened during Y2K? No? 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 Yes. Clocks. Yeah. Hmm? Clocks. Clocks. Yes. One, two. Okay. Five. Right. Okay. Really. Well, my experience was I was in I was a global project manager in PwC at the time. So I was watching, you know, those hundred and fifty five countries and all that sort of thing. I was watching the clock ticking through midnight in each of those. And this is something I can only tell you as hearsay. So 
as this is being recorded, I will officially say this is pure hearsay. But I thought I imagined that something happened in New in New Zealand, and I thought I imagined purely hearsay that something happened in Japan to do with a nuclear facility in possibly one or the other of those countries, or maybe somewhere else. I imagined, mm. Mm. and that was really interesting. And then immediately the news went dead mm. because. Reputational damage is the worst thing that can happen in our world, isn't it? It can kill businesses. It can kill countries. Yeah. So, um, no. Thank goodness, nothing. Ha thank goodness, nothing happened as far as Y2K was concerned. We have to do some. We have to do some repairs. Actually. No. There were no repairs to what? Nothing happened. <laughs> no. No. We, we have to, but there was nothing sort of total critical. Right. right. I was right. working for a British couple at the time. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing. We in IT got really panned, didn't we? Mm. For wasting a lot of money and, you know, yeah. all those scare stories and so on. So, what can we do now? Well, there are lots of programs, including ones which the government is supporting. And here's one I wanted to just highlight to you. It, um, have you heard of, who's heard of Cyber Essentials? No? Yes, yes, yes. Few yeses. Okay. This is to do with cybersecurity and it's to do with readiness for cybersecurity. And it's aimed not so much as the FTSE 100, 250, the top companies with loads of people, but at SMEs, small and medium sized organizations that say, Look, hey man, what should I do? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. So, Cyber Essentials is essentially a tick list sometimes supplemented by a penetration test. Okay, so the essence of it was a guidance and certification scheme launched in May 2014. People registered, um, clients registered, and they got a questionnaire to fill in and optional penetration testing because there were different grades of this program and different companies involved in it. And here are two organizations that helped develop it, IASME and the ISF. But in fact, it was started by even smaller firms who thought of the ideas concept. And then IASME and ISF got together. And then somebody told someone in the government, the government said, hey, that's a good idea. We ought to put our names to it. Now that we've made sure that it all works and there's no big um, uh, embarrassments to do with it. And so, it became a set of basic technical controls. Do you have virus checking? Do you have, uh, you know, uh, do, do you have firewalls? Do you have, and you go tick, 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 and then send it off, and they say, fantastic. The simplest version said, fantastic, you get a cyber, cyber essentials tick. The later version said, Oh, and can you do a penetration test? You could use one of these penetration testing companies if you like. Right, so tick, 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 penetration test failed on 80% of it. Sorry, no tick, big smack on the hand instead. Do it again. Get the penetration test satisfactory in terms of your infrastructure, then you get the cyber essentials. So there are a number of organizations that offer it, including ITGI, IT Governance Institute, something like that, uh, and lots of others, they offer it, but those cyber essential ba badge essentials badges, when you do have it, is backed by industry, including the Federation of Small Businesses, the Confederation of British Industry, and a number of insurance organizations which offer cheaper insurance premiums if you've got that. So I believe tens of thousands of firms are members of that, but I don't know where to look to find the actual statistics. I've been to some of the individual organizations and they said, yeah, here's a list of ours, but we don't know the others. So I think, I don't know how well coordinated it all was. But anyway, cyber essentials. Why am I going on about this? Because I have developed something called Brex IT. Brexit, which is an IT readiness program relating to how you can get 
your company, IT ready for Brexit. Now, I sincerely hope that in your, if you're in a huge company, who is in a company of more than 5,000 people? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Let me ask you a leading question. Are, is your company doing anything about GDPR at the moment? At yeah. the moment. Are they on the case? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Right. Is your company doing anything about Brexit at the moment that you know of? Not as far as I know. See? Here's the concern or the opportunity, whichever way you want to think about it. A lot of the thinking that needs to be done is actually the same. But people are not saying in terms of Brexit right now. I do know that Barclays are actually hiring people, in London anyway, are actually hiring people to work on Brexit initiatives. I do know that other companies are moving, so moving infrastructure to other countries to cater for Brexit. But a lot of the compliance people are actually sucked up doing GDPR at the moment for understandable reasons. And the one after that will be to do with Brexit. From what I gather, very few companies are actually reaching out to their employees and saying, hey, we want you. Just that. Yeah? Just imagine if somebody says to you, don't worry because your rights will be protected after we leave the EU. That would cost, let's see, what's the cost of three million letters? Probably less because they're in families, yeah? Three million letters in the post or whatever. Don't worry because you will be looked after. You, yeah? Coming back to my wife, that's all it would take to switch her from being somebody who says, right, let's go, <laughs> we've, we've done Frankfurt, let, let's go off and look at Berlin, etc. Yeah? From that to, well, you know, I am a Londoner, I'm going to, I've lived in London for more than 30 years, I'm going to remain here. This is my, this is my home, this is my place. It doesn't take much, does it? And the same on a company level. How much effort would it be for companies, and the big ones are actually doing this already, identifying people who might be at threat because of Brexit? And saying, hi, um, look, just a personal chat. You're from Poland, and I just want to let you know, we're doing some planning, we'd like you to be part of it. Three things. Are you planning anything in terms of Brexit? And let me uh, switch to a side discussion here. I know you have a family. I know you have children at school. So are you, and I know you have a mortgage. Are you worried about how your mortgage is going to pay, get paid after March 2019? Are you worried about whether your children will be able to stay in their schools or not? after 2019, are you worried about where you might live? And more to the point, are you doing anything about it? Because of course, in human terms, our own personal strategies for our lifestyles need something like a three-year life, a three-year time scale, three-year lead time or something. How long would it take you to sell your house, buy somewhere else, move there, find schools, etc.? I would say probably about three years, wouldn't you? I think that's a reasonable sort of time scale especially if I had primary school children and so on, I would be worried. And I can assure you, a lot of people that I speak to are worried, but all they need is that reassurance. Um, back to my wife. Uh, she has um, uh, looked at the gov.uk website and said, OK, fine, so what if I want to apply for UK citizenship or whatever it takes to guarantee a place in the UK? And the answer is a lot of months and up to £1,800, which is the cost of application, which most of us don't know. And there's this great test, uh, I'll cap encapsulate some of these things now. There's this great test of Britishness which you've got to pass to show that you're worthy of living in the UK. 
Now, I haven't read the question, but let me make some up. What, what is a googly? What? Sorry? What did you say, sorry? What is a googly? A googly. I'm testing your Britishness. Right, okay. Um, how many runs in an over and which sport does it relate to? Uh, all in an over. Six. 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 Right, okay, good. What's a balm cake? Cold. Bread roll. Bread roll. I've done this in, I've done this in BCS Manchester and they said, why, why do they want to know things like that? It's obvious, isn't it? And then I've asked some others which are rather more to do with the South. Uh, well, let me ask you one of those. Yeah, right. Um, where are the seven sisters? No, sorry. I said that wrong. I'm really sorry. What are the seven sisters? System of blocks. On a canal. Uh, rocks. Cliff, 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 it's usually, it usually refers to the white, uh, you know, the structure of cliffs around on the south coast near Dover. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, so there, there are things like this, you see. But you know, uh, um, I right. Here, here's something interesting. Um, Crumbera and Kartoffel. What's the difference? Kartoffel is potatoes, isn't it? In German. Krumbe is potato in southern German dialect. <laughs> things like this, but you you know, and you can imagine lots of other things to do with uh, with here. Yeah. Um, is it really? Um, oh yeah. I must I must desist from this, but you know. I've done ones with Ilkley Moor Bartat, I did that in Brighton. <laughs> what? No idea, and so on, you know. But these are all parts of things which one can relate to in terms of being British. But why on earth should people know this? I'm not quite sure. But there are various machinations that are being put together by the government to ensure that people are worthy of living here and so on. Yeah. Good. Super. I have done this. I put together a program of 11 activities, which I'll come to in a minute. That is a framework which includes 11 activities, a number of steps for each of those, milestones, deliverables, and control tests to make sure they're working. We'd require clients to sign up so we know who they were, and we would administer it. Now, DSL is my company, Dalian Services Limited, alias me. Yeah. I don't think I'm probably the right person to put this into countrywide implementation. I think the BCS is though. I think it would be kind of excellent if the BCS did take it on. But I think they're worried about the risk involved. So there's an admin process to, to monitor the client's status. The results, we would collect the results of client status, the evidence of deliverables, the results of tests, and how many ticks or whatever we give them. Yeah? Now, evidence of deliverable, there's something which could be risky, isn't it? Because if people send us evidence, they could be manipulating that. And also, how do we know that's right? Well, it's very simple. What you do is you bring that right down to a sort of self-certification level. You make sure that the clients who have signed up with you, you only accept information from that person, typically the CIO, or typically the chief something officer. They would self-certify that their organization has done this, this being an asset register or other deliverables. They would send us information. Ah, but wait a minute. What about confidential data, personal data? They shouldn't be doing that, should they? Not in the new world of GDPR especially. But we don't actually want to see that. We would be happy with receiving a spreadsheet of their asset register, for example, with the sensitive information columns blanked out. So you can see the framework of it, and you have the CIO's assurance that they've done that. Because what we want to encourage is 
people getting on the right lines with a framework of things that they can work to and just helping to look inside their companies and getting themselves ready for the next thing. Let's call it Brexit, or we could call it IT strategy. Yeah? And a lot of SMEs aren't familiar with doing this because they're just keen to stay alive, stay competitive, make the money, all that sort of stuff. We need some tools, and um, that could be, well, an, SA, an SAP, SAP uh, RDBMS um, system would be good uh, with um, some sophisticated forecasting and monitoring and analysis software to help you do what if analysis. Or you might use a piece of paper or an Excel spreadsheet. And typically, cutting it down to the basics, you could, get, you could use spreadsheets and things to capture information and status. But we would need to do some consultancy, and here's another opportunity for us. And we could do some consultancy because people would need to be, have this explained to them. Not a lot of consultancy, but how do you do it? What does it mean? And um, then to monitor what they're doing. So that is my Brexit program. And uh, <clears throat> I'm saying and I'm stressing that it's mine, but that's not how I would like it to be, yeah? Okay, what are these 11 activities I'm talking about? See if you recognize any of these. Now, you won't recognize this, because this is my representation of a typical organization. So, let me help you. There are lots of things that organizations do. Manufacturing, production, supplies, etc. I'm interested particularly in the governance function, the asset management function, the service management function, risk management, and project management. And I've generalized those quite a bit. What do I mean by that? Well, what I would like, step one, review, and this is, I'm addressing this to the client, Review your environment. Look at what you've got and the business you're in. And decide if that's the right environment for you. Because if you've always made um, computer keyboards for uh, that French company in the, south of, in the south of France, in Toulouse, ever since you went on that holiday and met the uh, uh, CIO of um, Aerospatial and struck up a friendship and he told you how poor his keyboards were, ever since then, you've been supplying them with keyboards. If that's what you want to keep on doing, great. And if you want to stay in IT, great. But review your environment. Try and see if there's some cost savings or obvious wastage in what you're doing. <clears throat> Understand your business objectives. And this is something that we in IT really need to do better, isn't it? And, you know, we are typically hanging around below, the, sorry, outside the door of the boardroom, trying to listen to what's going on, and then misinterpreting what actually comes out. Well, understand the business objectives is very fundamental. Because, for example, uh, taking that silly example of um, the uh, computer keyboards, if you really want to keep on manufacturing things for your chum in the south of France, Great. Do some what-if analysis. What if we leave the EU and have to incur extra customs charges, customs paperwork, new SLAs, maybe increased lead times, and all that sort of thing? What if? What sort of costs are we talking about? Is that what we want to do? Or is it that our company actually wants to make 10% year-on-year profit. In which case, why don't you look at what else there is around you? Why don't you look in your local area, see the sort of, see the sort of small companies and suppliers you've got here, see how you can achieve that 10% profit using them instead. Let's take a silly example. We're in the UK, so why don't, we must be good at things to do with rain. Why don't you go into making umbrellas instead? Surely there must be 10% profit in that. Yeah? What's the problem with making umbrellas? Yeah? Doesn't always rain. Doesn't always rain. 
Or just always rain? Doesn't. No, that's not what I heard in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason might be because there are lots of companies doing it already. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. Might be because there are lots of companies doing it already. Right. Lateral thinking. I'm going to have a fun event in uh, uh, Christmas time on lateral thinking. But lateral thinking, I didn't mean rain umbrellas, I meant sun umbrellas. Why don't you go into making sun umbrellas <coughs> and sell them to Saudi Arabia? Good idea? Could be a competitive market? No, no, I didn't mean that either. Why don't you make sun umbrellas decorated with little pearls around the rim. They could become a great fashion accessory, you know, Burberry, etc., etc. Fashion accessory. So ladies in Riyadh could be going around with them. They rarely open them or, or use them, but everybody's got one of your sun umbrellas. 10% profit. Ha! Go for 50%. That's more like it. Why don't you look at a different way of doing things? Why don't you look at your local area and see how you can make use of uh, more of the innovation and entrepreneurship that's going on there? Come back to your company. Who is responsible for what? Now, in big companies, this tends to be defined and you've got um, job specs and all that, right? So there's quite a lot of work that's done on trying to make sure there aren't any gaps. In small and medium-sized companies, it's much more ad hoc. There is actually much more likely to be gaps and things. But here's an opportunity for us, or if we took on this program, let's, you know, let's say if we were all doing it for DSL, we would be able to lend our expertise because we're IT professionals and being able to help those SMEs a bit better. If we had the BCS umbrella, then even better. Oh, sorry, did I say BCS umbrella? Let's just stick with the badge, <laughs> then even better. Confirm the responsibilities of who does what in your company. Why is this important for Brexit? Because we want to make sure that no people who are in, um, uh, what's it called, critical jobs to achieve your business objectives or um, have an unknown status post-Brexit. In other words, you need to guarantee the, the continuing availability of those people after Brexit. When do you need to do that? Probably you need to start doing that about three years before it happens. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, well, let's say you need to do that right now immediately. Hmm? Okay. You need to select Brexit tools. In other words, what is your company going to use to capture this information? Here's a hot clue. If you're doing things for GDPR, it's probably just a question of adding a couple of extra columns and you're going for Brexit as well. All you really want to know is the um, origin and the destination of different assets. Do they relate to one of the 27 countries of the EU or not? If yes, then put a red or amber tag there as being something that you need to investigate a bit. Do some what-if analysis, and then try and do something. We've talked about people quite a bit. Why can't you say to your European workers, look, don't worry, because if it comes to you having to leave the UK, we will be opening an office in Warsaw. You might think of it as a Regis rented space, but it will be our office. We will have our equipment in there for you to do WebEx and conference calls and all that sort of stuff um, to our place here in Nottingham. So it will be our office even though it's remote. You can go there and use it whenever. You can also do much more work from home. And once a month or once every two months or whatever, you'll get an invitation to come to a company meeting here in Nottingham. You will continue to work with us. We will continue to work with you, even though you won't actually be here. So something like that could work. You know? Or 
it could work in terms of other remote working, joint working, other initiatives like that. Just to make people feel that your company values them. Because we, we all want to feel loved and wanted, don't we? And that's the problem with the current situation that certainly my wife feels, which is nothing. That's the problem. Yeah? Okay. So categorize your assets and processes. And it's not only people, it's all those other things to do with our software, hardware, infrastructure. Where do we get those bits from? And how will we continue to be able to use them after 2019? For example, um, do you use things which are um, uh, coming from well, coming from the EU, EU and going to the EU? That's obvious. But what about your backup things? You're backing things up. Where do you back them up to? Does Iron Mountain or some other company come and take your data off-site? Where do they take it? Yeah. Or do you use the cloud? Which cloud? Where? What? countries' rules govern it? Is it US law, like with most Microsoft products and so on? Is it um, German law, like with SAP-related products? Is it UK law, which lots of things actually do have um, as their jurisdiction? Is it Irish law? Yeah. So there are those things. Now, not a big deal. You know, we all, we all read down the terms and conditions, don't we? We all read through all that small print before we download any new bit of software, don't we? You know, there's 17 pages of small print before we click I agree, yeah? Does anyone not do that? Surely everybody does that. We just click I agree and move on to the next thing. That's the problem. What you need to do is have somebody who understands that just to run their eye off that, uh, you know, down that list. You need lawyers. Ah, oh, did I tell you about lawyers? Law, I, 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 in London, of course, I know lots of lawyers, IT lawyers as well. Most of them are getting extremely picky about which customers they go to and do things for. They're doing things on GDPR already. Some of them are Brexit experts. And boy, are they booked up. I mean, this isn't a scare story, this is just fact. Some of them have got a lead time of months and months and months already because they're working for the big companies and so on. So if you want them, well, number one, might be a long lead time. Number two, hope you've got lots of money and, the, uh, and you're prepared to pay a fee which is increasing by a percentage every month because lawyers are the next thing that you need to get on the case, just to make sure your SLAs and so on are okay. Especially for things that have got a license period which ends um, around 2019. Yeah? So, okay. So you need to do all of those, then standard risk management, list your relevant SLAs, key performance indicators, suppliers, customers, identify the risks, assess the risks and, uh, and all those other things, put controls in place so that you can say, ah, oh, wait a minute, we've got a problem here, we need to do something. Plan your actions, apply the actions, monitor and communicate. Now, this is my revolutionary Brexit methodology. Good, isn't it? Yeah? It doesn't resemble anything you've ever seen before, does it? <coughs> That's it. And if you do this, and you're in a small company, or let, let's take it for us, if we guide small companies to doing that, we may well not only get some consultancy for ourselves, but we will be helping them, I think. Don't you? Mm. Yeah? And... So here's the client process. Oh, sorry. What would a what would what would a well, you can see how close we are to the end. It's almost the end. Help. What do we do? Try and go backwards and backwards and backwards. One more. I can't do it. No more. Let's go this way. There. Uh, yeah. So okay. So there's the client process. If you're a client, you register, you obtain guidance, you do it. In other words, perform the activities and send the results to DSL. 
um, you keep on collecting status and evidence because once you've got the idea of it, you just keep on doing it. And by the way, as a PwC auditor, I can tell you, this is the sort of stuff that auditors want, wish all companies did and just put in a folder somewhere so they could, could easily go and get audited. It would save weeks, stroke, months of audit time per company. You obtain the tip to show that it's all going along the right lines, and then you use the tip. How do you use the tip? You stick it on your emails. We have the tip to show that we're on the road to Brexit. You know, and people, after a while, start saying, hey, what's that? And you've got a conversation going. And you know how those conversations are valuable to salespeople. Yeah? And then you can start explaining and so on. OK, so supposing we've got a client doing all this, then um, we can see here, I'm not going to explain to you what red, yellow, and green means. We can see here that they really don't understand what their business objectives. They really need to do more work on that with the CEO involved. Yeah? Their responsibilities in that company, they, you know, there are loads of gaps. They, you know, they've got three people doing this, two people doing that, there's a gap there, and so on. They need to get that together. And then they're on the case in terms of selecting their Brexit tools, categorizing assets. Oh, sorry about this. Uh, see? Come on, dude. Um, monitoring and communicating and reviewing the environment. They need to, uh, they're on the case about that, but they need to do more work. They haven't even started with any of these. It's immediately obvious what this means, isn't it, if you know those 11 steps. Okay. But don't and you think it's because there is still so much uncertainty? They think by doing, you know, they, they might be doing this and they don't need to in the end. You know, for they might spend money that they don't need to. For what? For? For what? For Brexit? For Brexit. For Brexit, yeah. But... The point about this is that the, you can use Brexit as a lever to start this, but it's not really just about Brexit, is it? Yeah. No, I mean, it's good yeah. if they did that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, small and medium enterprises uh, don't really have that much money, and they probably see it as this money that they might be spending might... Um, might not have been necessary. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's another word I'll use for all this. It's an IT strategy framework. Mm -hmm. The subtitles are, do you know what your company is going to be doing in two years' time? Are you planning for that? Do you know what you want to be doing in two years' time? So that's the, you know, that, that's the subtitle to this. And if you don't, then you probably need to have a look at your purchasing processes and all that sort of thing. Because you might well be able to buy licenses more effectively. You might be able to do a whole load of things more effectively. Because a big word that's underneath all of this is are you thinking about the future? Yeah? So I've done all this because of the Brexit uh, thing. But you know, you can see that SMEs don't have time to do all this. It would be great if they could just get a little booklet or something with a set of steps, do this, and there are IT professionals who can help guide you in some of this. Yeah. Um, how readily it would be available, how freely it would be available, I can't say because we haven't got it. <laughs> we haven't got it going. I've developed quite a few layers of this, and here's an example. So that's step four. That's uh, activity four. There's what we'd want. Here's activity five, and there's what we want. Again, no secrets, please. No company confidential data. Blank those out before you send them to us. We just want to know that you're, you know, you're on the case, and you're looking after your company's future. Because this is part of getting the UK more innovative and entrepreneurial and all that sort of thing. Let's look after our IT and then go and see your CEO and say, hey boss, we've got some tough things coming up with GDPR, Brexit, etc., etc. I just want you to, to know that as far as Brexit is concerned, don't worry about the IT. Here are some what-if scenarios and we know what to do in these cases because we've made the plans. 
Okay, so my final slide. So how can you help? BCS slogan, help make IT good for society via risk-focused IT risk management for Brexit, especially for SMEs. Why Brexit? Because we all will be focused on Brexit very soon. So it's a good way to grab the attention of a whole load of small companies. Encourage firms to advance their Brexit readiness, where it's not like GDPR and then other compliance programs, because of the people and the need to get them primed. And HR needs to be on that case. And I know for a fact from my wife that she is not being given TLC. She's being given nothing. And of course, to most people, that means, well, you know, she hasn't been told she has to go, so that means it's okay. We want her. Is that really how humans think? No news is good news. <laughs> Absolutely good. Stick with it. Keep running your company. Don't be surprised if half your workforce aren't there, because, you know, if you say something positive to somebody, you get a much more loyal employee. I think that's more likely than it works. And HR needs to get cracking straight away to anchor down all the people who are in your key functions, your critical functions especially. Contracts and, and SLAs, well, I told you about the legal people and so on. You really need to get somebody legal looking through all your contracts and stuff. You should be doing this anyway. But again, SMEs don't necessarily have that sort of manpower. They have to buy it from somewhere. And the market is getting increasingly expensive. That's my point. So you need to do this at least a year before. Locations and logistics. Are you in the right locations? Are you happy about the supply chains and things like this? What are you doing uh, if your goods and services need extra paperwork to go, you know, secure the, secure the borders? Wonderful. Borders are two-way. Yeah? So it's not only people coming in that you want to stop. It's your things going out that you want to enable. <clears throat> what are you doing about that? So you need to get your supplies or logistics people on the case to decide how they're going to do that. Um, then, if you've got wonderful um, self-replicating uh, um, software, sorry, self software functions, so that when you do a financial tra transaction here, then over there it duplicates that immediately and so on. Where is there? Is there in the EU? If so, what are you going to do about it? Is that good? Is that bad? Do some what-ifs and decide. That applies to a whole load of things, of course. And then, business continuity, including all that stuff you are backing up to the cloud. I don't use, I don't use um, uh, cloud. I only use Office 360. That's the only cloud-related thing I think I've got. And all my company uses that for it, for all low-level things. Ah, okay, so where is that backed up? Which cloud, where, etc. Just make sure you know and that you'll be able to continue in a known way. And publicize Brexit readiness to the board and customers. It could be seriously good for you as an IT person to show you're on the board it could help your position within your company, and it could help your company's position in its competitive environment. And that actually applies to how many things in IT? And we in IT are really good at change management, project management, what-if analysis, risk management. These are things that we are good at. Yeah? After all, Y2K, Nothing happened because of us. So, <laughs> so that's the message.